This is Bible Academy. Today we begin a special, the Rapture Special. But before we get started, let's make sure that we have confessed our known sins, according to 1 John 1, 9. At the same time, we want to make sure that we're controlled by the Holy Spirit. And we have to do that by giving ourselves over to Him. Let's pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity and the privilege, the time, the freedom, everything you have given us to study your word. We ask that our hearts and minds be open and ready to hear it. In Jesus' name, amen. If you were to ask a Bible teacher what are the most popular topics, they'll almost always say it's, well, it's eschatological topics things about the future. And that's true. Those are the biggest booksellers. They're the ones that dominate the bookshelves, Uh, even the movies, Christian movies, I think. Um, But at the same time, if you get specific, they would say, well, the rapture is always popular. The other big popular topic that I've learned uh, over the years is the Antichrist. You talk about the Antichrist, or the rapture, and you can fill an auditorium if you already have a decent attendance already. But you talk about Romans or Christology or soteriology, and you may not even have much attendance at all. And that's unfortunate, because those topics are just as important. Well, let's get into our introduction. As most of you are aware, there are different views on the rapture particularly the timing of the rapture. The approach to this study will be to look at the primary passages on the subject and interpret them for what the text says. Now, this is a challenge for those who are predisposed to a particular view, to be objective and set aside one's long-held views is difficult for all of us. This may involve setting aside many of the teachings of our favorite preachers or teachers, books, and even movies. Regardless, the objective here is getting to the truth. So I ask you to do the difficult thing. Wipe your slate clean and start afresh. If one is not willing to do that, his lens may be so skewed that truth may be overlooked in favor of comfort or tradition. Though it's not my intention to teach a particular view, it will become obvious where this study is leading. At that point, I will take some side trips to point out how other views interprets the passage and let you decide based upon the evidence presented. One of the things that's common in books written on this subject is that the person often opens with his own experience. Let me just say a few words about that. My experience goes back to the early 70s when I learned about the pre-trib rapture. Uh, That came out very prominently during the early 70s with a book called The Late Great Planet Earth by Hal Lindsey. It popularized the subject uh, it's founded by other subjects like Armageddon and uh, similar topics. I went on to attend a church that taught that for years and years. I attended a seminary that taught that. I attended a second seminary that taught the pre-trib rapture. But at the same time, while I was in these seminaries, I learned the languages. I learned the Greek. I learned the uh, Hebrew. Uh, and I began to look at these passages myself and began to question my views. If you hold to pre-trib rapture or post-trib rapture or somewhere in between, I'll talk about that in a moment, my asking of you, let the scripture speak. Look at the word of God. Let it speak. Don't let that interpretation that reminds that remains in your head to do the interpretation for you. 
let the scripture speak to you. And of course, that assumes the Holy Spirit is at work. Well, let's begin by looking at the subject of what is the rapture? Well, you probably know that the term rapture doesn't actually appear in scripture, but that does not mean that the concept or idea is not there. So we'd go to the scripture from which the idea is drawn, and that's in 1 Thessalonians 4.16. So let's make sure we're on the same page on this subject. 1 Thessalonians 4.16 reads, as I have it on the board, Because the Lord himself will come down with the command shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are remaining, will be snatched away together with them in the clouds for a meeting of the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. The term snatched away, future passive indicative of harpazo, I have here on the board as well. It means to seize, to snatch away, to take away, both quick and forceful. The subject receives the action. So the subject is uh, uh, snatched away. That's the idea. It's used for a wolf in uh, snatching sheep, John 10, 12, for the evil one snatching away what's been sown in the heart, Matthew 13, 19, for the soldiers taking Paul away from the crowds, Acts 23, 10. So it is uh, a snatching away. But in the Latin, the Vulgate is where we get the word rapture. The Latin is rapio, or rapio, to seize, to carry off, from which comes the word rapture. Now, this is one of the first passages, what we just read up here in 1 Thessalonians 4.16, that people will take you to when they're talking about the rapture. So right away you have an idea, oh, it's snatching away. It's a, it's, a, it's a rapture passage and there's going to be a rapture. That's right. There's no doubt about that. But we need to keep the rapture in perspective. And that's where it often gets people off base. We go to the larger context and the main topic. Always study the context. The main topic starts back in... 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. That is the main topic of this particular section. Okay. Paul writes, now listen carefully. Again, let the text speak to you. But do not, but do, we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who are asleep, so that you may not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. Now, that gives you the reason Paul is writing this. We don't want you to grieve as if there's no hope. And it's concerning those who are asleep. Paul continues, For we believe that Jesus died and arose. So also we believe God will bring those with him who have fallen asleep through Jesus. All right? Paul identifies those who have fallen asleep, those who are asleep in verse 13 with those who have fallen asleep in verse 14. Okay, pretty simple. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, who are remaining at the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who are asleep. Before we leave this verse, I want to point out one thing to you. Notice the word coming. Very critical word in our study. Just hold on to that one. We'll come back to it, but basically, uh, remember this, that the uh, Greek word is parousia. Easy one to remember, parousia. You've probably heard it many times. All right, so, who are remaining at the coming of the Lord will not precede those who are asleep. Okay, so that basically tells us that those who have died, fallen asleep, will precede those who are alive. That's not news to you. 
Here's why. Because the Lord himself will come down with the command shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise up first. All right, so they're going to go first. And this is how it happens. Then we who are alive, verse 17, who are remaining will be snatched away together with them in the clouds for a meeting of the Lord in the air. We're going to go up there for a meeting. We're going to meet with the Lord. The dead in Christ and those who are alive in Christ will both be snatched up, raptured into the air to meet with the Lord. Notice the word meeting, meeting. And so we will always be with the Lord. That's a key point. We'll always be with the Lord. Once we meet him, we will never be separated uh, physically as we are now. We're always going to be with him uh, nearby in some way. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, let's look closely at what we've just read. The passage is about, let's go back to verse 16, well, maybe even further, about those who are asleep and how they are in connection with the alive believers when Christ comes back. So, simple question, and this is important that you understand this. Now, I know it sounds rather maybe pedantic, or maybe it's beneath this, it sounds beneath some of your knowledge already, but just, just follow me. Notice, when people rise up from the dead, what do we call that? A resurrection. This is about the resurrection. It's not about the rapture. The rapture is a term to describe the resurrection. Do you understand? That's a big point. It's about the resurrection. This is the resurrection of believers. Now, the timing is another issue. But let's understand first, this is the resurrection of believers. All right. The comfort that comes when he says, therefore comfort one another with these words, the comfort is in the Thessalonians knowing that both the previously deceased Christians and the alive Christians are going to go up just one after the other. You probably uh, have less than a second between them, probably just a, a, a very f fraction of a second. And they'll basically ascend together to meet with the Lord. All right? Boom, boom. We're there with the Lord. Now, as I said, this is about the resurrection. Now, let's go talk about resurrections. Resurrections. Our main passage, 1 Corinthians 15, 20. But let me do a little preview here for you. 1 Corinthians 15, 20. Let me, I don't want you to be distracted by stuff underneath here, so let me uh, move that up a little bit if I can. Okay, let's just talk about resurrections. In 1 Corinthians 15, the Apostle Paul is writing about the resurrection of Christ, and this leads into other resurrections of believers. Let's read 1520. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. All right, simple principle. Christ has been raised. Paul's been discussing resurrection. He starts about he, he starts in about Christ in particular. He's been resurrected. And he's called the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep again. That means they've died. The believer is pictured as fallen asleep, 
not permanent, when he dies. Christ had fallen asleep first. He's the first one that fell asleep. Now, though Christ has been raised from the dead, he's also still the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep of, of Christians that will be raised from the dead. Now, he's the first fruits, and we'll get into that in just a moment, exactly what first fruits means. But let's talk about, well, let's go ahead and talk about that now. Under the Mosaic Law, first fruits was, was that part of the harvest that, when harvested, was dedicated to the Lord. There's some scripture, Exodus 23, 19, Leviticus 23, 10, Deuteronomy 18, 4. Paul uses this as an analogy to Christ being the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Now, the fallen asleep will lead into something else. It's going to lead to the resurrection, obviously, but he's using it right now just regarding fallen asleep. Fallen asleep is a phrase used to describe the temporary state of the believer's body until resurrected. Okay? He's fallen asleep. He's going to get up. With Christ being called the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, this implies more will follow. All right? Just like the first fruits of the harvest. The harvest continues on with what's next. So the passage continues on. However, it deviates for a moment. For since the death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also came through a man. Death came through Adam, right? Resurrection of the dead also came through a man. It came, comes through the God-man, Jesus Christ. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. So there you have another thing in common with man. First you have the death, and then you have the life. The point is that spiritual and physical death came to all mankind through a man, Adam. So also, spiritual life and physical life, that's resurrection, comes to man through one man, the God-man, Jesus Christ. Okay, now that's the deviation. Then Paul comes back. Once we establish where mankind is going to get his, his resurrection spiritual life from, which is Jesus Christ, the God-man, Paul gets back to the topic when he says in verse 23, but let's understand what he's doing here. He's going to write to the different orders or echelons of the resurrection. Here we go. But each in his own order. Christ the first fruits. that's the first order, right? Then at his coming... There's our word parousia. All right, that was up in the passage we saw in Thessalonians. Those who belong to Christ, then the end when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. So we're talking about the orders of, of resurrection or the echelons. Let's outline that a moment. First, Christ is the first fruits. Second, at his coming, those who belong to Christ, that's you and me. All right? Let's talk about Perusia for a moment before we look at the third one. All right? Important topic. It keeps showing up. Christ's coming, Christ's coming. Coming of Christ. All right? At his coming. The word parousia means the presence of one coming, hence the coming or the arrival. When parousia is used of Christ, don't miss this, in an eschatological use, that means a future context, it always refers to the second coming. Look at these scriptures. Matthew 24, 3, 37 and 39, 1 Corinthians 15, 23, the Thessalonian passages, all of these. James 5, 7, and 8, 2 Peter 1, 16, 3, 4, 1 John 2, 28. Now, let me just enter this. However, those who hold to the pre-trib view will sometimes say that it refers to the pre-tribulational rapture. 
that it doesn't refer to the second coming. Okay, don't miss that. This implies there are two comings, conspicuously absent from 1 Corinthians 15, 23, and 24. All right. Let's go on. In agreement with all the other uses of the word parousia in an eschatological context and Christ, when Christ is being talked about, and the coming. The use of parousia here in this eschatological, eschatological context is the second coming of Christ. This is the second coming of Christ. All right. Again, verse 23. Then at his coming, those who belong to Christ, that's you and me. All right. Okay, now let's talk about the third resurrection. What? Yeah, third resurrection. It goes back, look at the verse again, to then the end. When he hands over the kingdom of God. All right, there's the end. What happens at the end? Well, we don't learn much about that until we get into uh, uh, Revelation, but we do have it mentioned in different times in Scripture, and we'll get to that later. But let's go ahead and look at it right now, what I want us to see. The third resurrection is at the end. This is those believers who are in mortal bodies during the millennial reign of Christ. They'll be changed from mortal to immortal when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, as that passage continues on. So from there we move into the eternal state of the new heavens and earth. All right, now that's not really our discussion right now. That's a, that's a, 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 a topic that, well, we may see that later. I've talked about it many times in other studies, but uh, that's not our concern now. Our focus here is in the second group. All believers who have died and are alive at the second coming, the parousia of Christ. Now you can already see that I've influenced the interpretation here because of a statement like this. Or one earlier, up here when I said whenever Perusia is used of Christ in an eschatological context or use, it's always refers to second coming. Well, the pre-tribbers would agree, disagree with that strongly. They can't take it that way. They have to interpret as a pre-trib. Okay, what I'm asking you to do is just take it as what we've learned so far. Uh, second coming is the second coming. So what do they do? Like I said here, what they'll do, they'll make the second coming in two parts. And they have kind of a funny way to justify that, but that's what they do. All right, there's not two parts. There's no reason to think that. Nothing in this context indicates that. That's a predisposed position imposing something on the text that's not there. Now, you may just shut down the study right now and run. That's fine. But before you do that, let me just say this. Let the text speak for itself. Work through the study. Look at the text. Try to work with that clean slate that I reminded you of. Now, there is another resurrection, but not a resurrection for believers. The only other resurrection, which is not in this context, is that of the resurrection of judgment, or what they call the great white throne judgment here. At the end of the millennium, Daniel 12, 2, Matthew 25, 46, hints at it. John 5, 28, 29, same thing, but it really is explained in Revelation 20, 11 through 14. Other than that, there's no other resurrection in the scripture. 
But let's talk about the resurrection body. It's always something we like to hear about. Nothing like getting out of this old earth suit. Resurrection body. We get that from 1 Corinthians 15.50. We get some detail. It's rather fascinating. Now this is what I'm, I am saying, brethren. Paul is writing, of course. He means brothers and sisters. That flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must, divine necessity, put on the imperishable. That must happen. And this mortal body must be must put on immortality. You can't inherit the kingdom of God, which is the believer's inheritance, without changing bodies. And yes, you can thank God for that right now. Now let's talk about something that's often, I think, extracted from this passage also. Paul says in verse 51, Behold, I tell you a mystery. Now, listen, folks. The mystery is described in the next few verses, or next few sentences. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. We're all going to be changed. And here's how. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. That's the mystery. So, don't say... The pre-trib rapture is the mystery. That's not the mystery. The mystery is that change that happens, how it happens. All right, it goes on, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised and perishable, and we shall be changed. So the dead's going to be raised, and it's going to be imperishable. Earlier, we didn't learn about, we learned about the dead are going to be raised, but we didn't see this part about the body change. And we would expect that. But this gives some details. So this is the mystery part of that subject being revealed. The mystery now revealed is the change of body when Christ returns. It happens instantly in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. That's a way of saying it happens instantly. Uh, my understanding is it's even quicker than you can blink. The perishable changes to the imperishable mortal to immortality. This is the mystery and not the rapture, as some may say. It comes at the last trumpet. The last trumpet, that's the trumpet blast. Trumpet blast was used in the ancient world to signal for something. Worship, announcement of a king, call to judgment, an alarm, summons to war, a call to assemble. Sounds like that might be the case here. It's a call to assembly. Meet with the Lord. Here it's a call to assemble with the Lord. Same trumpet call as in Matthew 24, 31. We'll get to that. And 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. All right. Which we just saw in uh, 1 Thessalonians. Now we come to the really big issue really big when is the rapture or as we've learned it's a resurrection so let's keep that in mind uh, i think if you get away from the term rapture and think of resurrection you put it in better perspective because you understand that the snatching away is part of that resurrection it's it's what happens during the resurrection Comparison of scenes. Now, what we're going to do, I'll explain this to you. The timing of the rapture is the most controversial question on this topic. There are several views on the subject with lines of evidence supposedly backing them all. The two most prominent views are the pre-tribulation rapture and the post-tribulation rapture. The lesser popular views are the mid-trib, 
partial trib and pre-wrath rapture. Pre-wrath rapture has gained some popularity over the years. I will continue to teach the scripture and let you decide which seems to be the best view and give my own conclusion. Though the use of parousia is good evidence for only one resurrection at his second coming, and not two resurrections or one in two parts as proposed by the pre-trib view, we should look at the other second coming passages to get an even clearer understanding. So let's look at some second coming passages. Now why do we want to do that? Well, first of all, let me say this. Let the scripture speak for itself. I remind you that again. Let's compare some scenes. Now, why do you want to compare scenes? Because one of the main arguments for seeing a rapture apart from the second coming is that when one compares the second coming passages with the rapture passages, they present very different scenes. Since this is the case, then, they cannot be the same event. In other words, they're saying, well, you read a rapture passage like we read in Thessalonians. That's not the same event as what's going on in the second coming passages. Second coming passages are, are very different. Are they? Are they? Well, let's look at some second coming passages. Uh, we'll start with the Old Testament, look at some of those. There's many, but uh, these are some I think better ones to look at. Let's start out with this one. Okay. We'll look at Isaiah 13, 9 through 12. Behold the day of the Lord. Notice the key phrase, day of the Lord. Day of the Lord, don't mess that. Behold the day of the Lord comes cruel, with wrath and fierce anger, to make the land a desolation, and to destroy its sinners from it. For the stars of the heavens and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be dark at its rising, and the moon will not shed its light. I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will put an end to the pomp of the arrogant and lay low the pompous pride of the ruthless." I will make people more rare than fine gold and mankind than the gold of Ophir. That means there's a lot of destruction. There's a lot of death. Four points we want to see here. Uh, first thing, notice. It's the day of the Lord. It's in verse 9. Day of the Lord. There is wrath. Okay, also see that in verse 9. There is darkness, there's all, all these cosmic events, okay, stars of the heavens and their constellations will not give their light, uh, sun's out, uh, moon will not shed any light off the sun, everything's out, it's dark. And then after the punishment, all right, I will punish the world for its evil, verse 11, not many people are left, a lot of people have died. Okay, so that's the scene. Let's do some more. Obviously, this passage emphasizes the judgment aspect of the day of the Lord. Okay, now in the book of Zechariah 12, 1 through 14, 1, it's a long passage. You should probably read that if you haven't, if you're not familiar with it. I studied it in some detail some years ago, put it on video. In the book of Zechariah 12, 1 through 14, 21, we have the second oracle, which is the second coming of Christ and his reception. This passage focuses in on the siege of Jerusalem, the battle of Armageddon, as we call it, and the Lord's return, the second coming. So this is a little bigger. Obviously, it's a couple of chapters, basically. I'm going to sum up the first part of it. We see the siege of Jerusalem going on. All the nations are gathered against it in Judah, 12, 2, and 3. The Lord begins to deliver, 12, 4 through 9. Much of Israel will turn to the Lord. It's a time when there's repentance and there's mourning, and many people will turn to the Lord at that time, particularly Jews. Land cleansed of false teaching. Hmm, that's been going on, 13, 1 through 6. Two-thirds of the people are killed. One-third repent. 
and they're refined. So this happens in the siege of Jerusalem. Two-thirds of the people in Israel will, will be killed. One-third will repent. And it becomes a great testing for them, and they're refined, 13, 7 through 9. And then we have the day of battle in 14, 1 through 3, and this is where we're going to pick up. All right? So again, we're getting to the second uh, coming. Zechariah 14, 3 and following. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in front of Jerusalem on the east. You're familiar with the territory over there. You know what this is. And the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west, forming a very large valley. Half of the mountain will move toward the north and the other half toward the south. Then you will flee by the valley of my mountains, for the valley of the mountains will reach to Azel. You will flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come and all the holy ones with him. Don't miss that, holy ones with him. It will happen in that day that there will be no light. Oh, we just saw that, didn't we? Luminaries will dwindle. Looks back to the beginning. It will be a unique day, which is known to the Lord, neither day nor night, but it will come about that at evening time there will be light. So at evening time there's going to be light again. And that day living waters will flow out of Jerusalem, half of them toward the eastern sea and the other half toward the western sea. It will happen in summer and in winter. Now these last couple of verses look forward to the millennium. And the Lord will be king over the earth, and that the day, and that and in that day the Lord will be one and his name one. So here we jump forward. We cover uh, basically the siege of Jerusalem, rather briefly actually. But then he says, once the Lord comes back, he'll get established, and then we will set up the millennial kingdom. And this is what this is referring to in the last couple of verses here. Okay, so let's break this down just a little bit from what we just saw. We're not going to say too much here. It's pretty revealing. The Lord returns to the Mount of Olives in front of Jerusalem. Mount of Olives, Olives splits in two. Survivors flee. That's in verses 4 and 5. Um. Uh, as we continue to read, uh, after they flee, notice the darkness occurs. Okay. Uh, on that day, it doesn't say at that moment things go dark once they flee. It just it will happen in that day. There will be no light. So it will be a day if there's not going to be a lot of light. People will flee. That's an opportunity to flee. The way I interpret this here. It's a unique day. Then he jumps into the millennial description. Okay. Living waters will flow out of Jerusalem. And they, they uh, go different directions, towards the eastern sea and the other half towards the western sea. All right, and it will continue on all summer and winter. It's a year-round thing. Now, before we move on, let me just ask you a quick question. Did you notice some of the differences between the Zechariah passages and what we saw up in Isaiah? You do see the darkness. That's in common, isn't it? Darkness? But you don't see the Lord coming down. It does have him coming with cruel, with wrath, and fierce anger. It doesn't have anything about him landing on the Mount Olives or splitting it. That type of thing does it. So there's differences in second coming passages, obviously. Let's look at one more. At least from the Old Testament standpoint. Some of this is quoted in the New Testament. Joel 2.30 through 32. We'll look at this part first. It's actually two passages in Joel. I will display, that means give wonders in the heavens, the sky, and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sunlight will be turned to darkness. We have that in common with all three passages, the darkness. And the moon to the color of blood before the day of the Lord comes. Hmm. Before the day of the Lord comes. Before the day of the Lord comes. One more time. Before the day of the Lord comes. So things go dark before the day of the Lord. That great and awesome day. And it will come about that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be delivered. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there will be deliverance of the remnant. 
even among the survivors. That's that one-third whom the Lord calls. Jump down to chapter 3, multitudes and multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. This is the this is battle of Armageddon, by the way. Sun and moon are darkened, and the stars will gather and diminish their brightness. The Lord roars from Zion, and from Jerusalem he gives forth his voice, and the heavens and the earth trembles. But the Lord is a refuge for his people and a stronghold to the sons of Israel. Now, let me set you up for the obvious question. Some may ask why there is not a rapture, or better yet, a, 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 a resurrection, to be more accurate, mentioned here. The only deliverance is for those in Jerusalem. We saw back in 232 where it says will be delivered here. Okay? Well, the emphasis here is on the second coming and his establishment of his kingdom. Uh, believers knew that a resurrection was coming, Job 19, 25 through 27, Daniel 2, excuse me, 12, 12 through 3, but no detail has been given yet, no, not revealed yet in Scripture. At the time of this writing, there hasn't even been a first resurrection, that of Christ, like we just saw in 1 Corinthians. So none of these Old Testament verses help us in establishing the resurrection of the saints in relation to the second coming. The reason is they're not supposed to. Now, we'll continue here next time with some more second coming passages, but they will be in the New Testament. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your marvelous word and what you have provided for us here in the text of your word. We ask that our hearts will be open and objective and listen to what your word says through the power of the Spirit. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.